and happy Saturday to you, everybody. Thanks for joining us here on Into the Absurd. I am your host, Tina Brock. I am the Producing Artistic Director here at the Idiopathic Ridiculopathy Consortium in Philadelphia. And so delighted that you've taken a little bit of time out of your weekend to be a part of Into the Absurd. We have so enjoyed being here with you every week. And on today's show, we're going to dill, dill, delve, we're going to dive. That was a combination of dive and delve. We're going to invent new words today. We're going to talk to Mark Williams. And Mark has a long history with the IRC. And we're going to talk to him about his graduate studies at the University of Maryland in media and projections and his journey along the way. And we invite you to join in on the conversation by putting your questions in the chat. If you're joining us on Facebook Live tonight, welcome, welcome to you. Thanks for taking time out to be with us and to our friends around the country and around the world. It is so much a delight to be with you here and we enjoy having you as we explore the existential quandaries and questions on Into the Absurd. Mark Williams. Mark is an old friend and such a, a big part of the Idiopathic Ridiculopathy Consortium's trajectory. I got to uh, know Mark. We all got to know Mark, Bob Schmidt, and Eric and I back when Mark was a student at Rowan University, and he helped us in all manner and form uh, during many productions here at the IRC. He worked in the tech booth up at Studio 5 at the Walnut. He was a man of all seasons, and he just pitched in, and his can-do attitude, his intelligence, and just uh, his ex extraordinary um, ability to solve problems and put his mind to work was of great use um, in many shows here at the IRC. He went on to work in props and uh, properties for the Walnut Street Theater, for Philadelphia Theater Company, for the Delaware Theater Company, and of course for the IRC. And he designed many very important props for the IRC, including um, a very special one for Betty's summer vacation, many for Exit the King, and uh, he's really contributed to what you see on stage, the scenic design and the properties design, which is such an important part. He went on uh, to the graduate studies program at the University of Maryland, and that's where we find him today in the media and projections, projections department. And we're gonna talk to him about a very important project, very successful project that he just completed uh, working on. So with all that in mind, uh, Mark Williams, welcome to Into the Absurd. Hello, Tina. Hello, hello. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so delighted to have you on, Mark. This is one of the, I, I want to say, maybe the second or third conversation we've had about set design. You know, Anna Corrales, mm -hmm. she was on with us earlier, designed a number of shows for the IRC. But I was so interested in your, well, I guess we got together because you were doing your portfolio. Yep, my portfolio review in the spring. Review this spring. And of course, the mm -hmm. University of Maryland is my alma mater. So I have a, a, a feeling for that, a very strong feeling for that school. And um, we got into talking about media and projection and how that is changing live theater, how it's changing virtual theater. And so that is the conversation that I wanted to, to, to sort of explode today on Into the Absurd. Yeah. I'd love to find out from you when you graduated from Rowan as a theater major. Do you remember that was, what? You... That was 2016, actually. And, 2016? Uh, after, yeah, after 2016, then I went straight into the apprenticeship program at the Walnut Street Theater uh, and became a props apprentice there. Yeah. Did you, when you were in school at Rowan or when you got out, did you have a sense of, of, of where you wanted to be? How did you make that decision that properties is where you wanted to, to find yourself? Oh. My journey at Rowan was interesting because I was actually primarily doing stage management stuff at Rowan and props is more of a side thing. And while at Rowan, I also started to explore for projections. My senior project at Rowan, which is kind of like our thesis for the uh, semester, was actually uh, focused on projections. And I did two, uh, two pieces uh, that were just revolved around the one of them revolved around the use of camera in the space and uh, reasserting the stage image onto the stage. Uh, and the other one uh, was a shadow puppet piece um, with a, a one woman show. And then there was interactive, creepy shadow puppets that were uh, projected around her. So I've always had this interest in projections. Um, I went into props um, because that was where my primary focus was at Rowan and what became my primary focus. But now uh, in 2020, I'm here in the graduate program at uh, UMD uh, for mm -hmm. projections and media. I'm studying under uh, Jared Mizachi uh who's become a little bit of a big name in uh uh how should i say um pandemic theater <laughs> so mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I can't wait to hear. I want to hear all about the show that you, that you've been working on and and hear about him and and he's your mentor at the University yep. of Maryland. Is that true? Leads so the cohort, the uh, projections and media design program. Yeah, that's. I want to ask you, Mark. I know as a director, as a as a a director, properties for me are so properties being anything. I guess you can define that for us, but I see it as a director as anything that is is handled or is integral to telling the story that is um you know that that needs to be constructed and or found and or sourced to lend authenticity to lend verisimilitude to the situation yeah. i guess that's that's a little bit of a a broad subject when you're talking about absurd theater because as you well have found yeah. out designing um for us but what is it about about that about finding Props. the specific pieces of of you know of life that you yeah. populate the stage with that so, help the actors you know you know i've gotten better at answering that question coincidentally from being in the, just being in the design program here at umd uh and before that i would normally answer that question with a labor answer which is properties is the set dressings and all handled objects while on stage and that's that's the labor answer. That's the union answer. So, mm -hmm. but I think I've I've come up with a better answer, which I've discovered through trying to be empathetic and think about the the people that are on stage, the characters of the play, and that's really what property is about. It's very similar into costumes in that props means something to the person on stage. It was chosen by a person on stage. Where he's like, you know, set is like, you know, this is how they built houses. This is how the architecture of the space, or this is how we're going to creatively uh, engage in some kind of sculpture that suits the mood and the idea of the play. With props, things are very related to the person. It's, mm -hmm. I have, I'm looking for an object on my desk, but it's actually a little messy right one. now. But like, I got one for you, Mark, here, I like a this. teacup, like yeah, my teacup. teacup. Right. That's, that's but, super important, right? Like, uh, First thing I grab on my desk, a lens pen. What is this used for? It's used for cleaning lenses and uh, optical equipment. And that, but that tells you something about me. That is that I handle mm -hmm. optical equipment and that I have cameras and stuff like that. And that's, I think, where props really connects to your play is that you have to start thinking about uh, who's on stage. What's the person's story? Why do they have this? Where do they get it from? How, how far back does it go? And that seems like a lot to just put a teacup on uh, on stage. And sometimes it is like they went to Ikea and they bought a teacup. Mm -hmm. They're the kind of person who shops at Ikea. But that is also a personality trait of them. Where do they shop? Why mm -hmm. do they shop there? Do you have uh, actors? I, I know in our time together when we've worked on shows at the mm -hmm. IRC, I've often um, will work in conjunction or I'll say, to, you know, say to you or just do it and then, and then say, Mark, is this okay? <laughs> in total Tina Brock, um, yeah. you know, is like, could I have a, I'd like to use this teacup because it has special meaning it, it, to me as an actor. Do you, do you find often that actors will ask you to bring something they own as that object that they can use or will a director come to you and, 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 and ask to, you know, that's that's a, a some usually answered by budget. So sometimes, especially in smaller black box theater, uh, yeah, absolutely. People will have like, I just know this works for the character, or I feel this works for my character, or I connect with this, uh, or they just have something that works. Um, sometimes, usually at companies like DTC or the Walnut, they'll maybe the character or the actor will talk about that, and then we'll go out and get that for them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I have had like a few instances where I've actually put like personal objects on stage because it's just like I know this is what's uh, mm -hmm. what should be used on stage. Um, even it was a production that had like a seven thousand dollar props budget, and still I took one of my old film SLR cameras, and I was like, because the uh, actress on stage was having trouble with the bulky one that I gave her, and I was like, this is a nice compact film SLR. And immediately she, she took to it because everything was just very intuitive. It was very small and very good for the stage. So mm. yeah, personal objects like that do sometimes end up on stage and things that we have connections to. Um, usually I try to just get one for the production just so there's no risk of hurting people's own personal belongings. But uh, yeah. Do you, wa do you ever watch in the same way a costume designer would look and say, um, might think, oh, um, you know, that that costume isn't isn't really the the actor hasn't really 
absorb that costume or that costume is not actually right for that character. Do you ever uh, observe where you just haven't selected the right prop? Does it get that specific for you where you feel like, I mean, you just gave an example, but is there, have you? Yeah, I think there are, there are situations where it's just like, he has a guitar on stage and it's just like, that's, he's, that's not the right guitar. That's not the right object for that person. Mm -hmm. And it can come down to period. It can come down to uh, the economic class of that person uh, and just, or how clean they are. Like, you know, you wouldn't have a a person who's um, very messy when it have like perfectly clean objects or if things might be dusty. Uh, you, you really just got to get into the living space and the headspace of the person who owns the object or handles the object and figure out what actually that that if that tells you everything you need to know about it um and plenty of times i put something on stage and it's just it's just not right like or i just put something on stage and, I, and they're like mm, this feels weird and i'm like it's a it's a do for a do for now prop mm-hmm. um and we just need to get the right thing for the for the character and it does function in the same way that the right object will help inform the action um Mm -hmm. as in the right costume will inform posture and how one carries themselves on stage which is why it's so often that the doofer needs to be right and sometimes we'll see rehearsal costumes that just have the structure and the um the feel of what the actual performance costume is going to be uh the same holds true for props What's the most unusual prop that you've ever had to create or source? Unusual? Uh, I think you know the answer to that. I was just going to say, I think it might be, I think it might be Betty's summer vacation, but like for those who didn't see the show, we'll just, if you saw the show, you know what we're talking about. It was the surprise in the refrigerator. And if not, we'll just, what's your second favorite prop that you've ever, well, I don't know. I guess we can talk about, well, no, let's not talk about it. Let's go to the second favorite prop. Uh, My favorite prop, which is probably not the most unusual uh, was um, we did, what was it? Honk at um, Delaware theater company. And in Honk, in the very beginning of the show, the, sh- the song, It's the Joy of Motherhood, um, we essentially have all these baby ducks hatching on stage. And the way we did it is, in most productions, it's just these little uh, wood cutouts, and then like they pop the top off of the wood cutout and reveal that they were hiding behind it. In this, we actually put them in giant eggs made out of foam in the same way that I make puppets. These were actually essentially giant puppets. I patterned them. I put children inside them and they sat on stage for about five or 10 minutes inside these eggs until finally we hit the song and these cute little kids start popping outside of these eggs and then they start doing a line dance while still wearing the egg. (laughs) So (laughs) So it was kind of costume and it was considered a prop Uh, and set. Yeah, it, it was just one of those beautiful moments where it's like something works so well and it makes its way into being incredibly influential into the choreography, uh, into the acting, and just into the entire pace of the show because those eggs get to be introduced like just from the from the get go, and then we see the joyous moment happen. So, <laughs> oh, that must have been a great feeling. Oh, I love that. That was still one of my favorites <laughs> to see that. Yeah. So you're you're finding these 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 moments. You're working for you know very large theater companies here in Philadelphia and in in Delaware. And what was the thing that made you decide you wanted to head back to I mean, to head back to graduate school to leave or to take that next step beyond? Yeah, properties? I think I was I was interested in getting back into a more. Um, creative aspect of theater. Now, I say that, and as I talk about props, I've been talking about how one can be creative with them. Um, But oftentimes when you're in props, it's a little bit of a struggle of uh, labor and um, just trying to, it's very service oriented props can be at times Mm -hmm. because people want what they want. They want to have it on stage and they don't necessarily ever care about your expertise or opinion. There's been many times, uh, and now I'm getting to the darker side of design and uh, theater (laughs) sometimes, but there's been many times when it's just like, I walk into a room and like, I have my research ready to go. And 
like and and i'll be incredibly informed on what's going on in the period i'll have like diagrams of like this is what these uh the styles of this period look like this is the indicators of what we should be looking for in our furniture and then someone will say like oh i thought this piece i saw at target uh would really work in the show and i'm just mm -hmm. like uh, sometimes because props is often at the bottom of the totem pole your opinion isn't valued whether or not you have expertise. I've encountered plenty of people who've appreciated uh, those expertise. Um, and some people who, they just want me to perform labor. <laughs> so Sure, they have a concept yeah. and it's very solid and they see something and that just fits right into it. I, I for one, Mark, will never forget the, I think it was hundreds of cigarette butts that you created for exit the king right. that we littered the the runway with the the red carpet runway that rob hutter had to come down and you created those out of it seemed like a very painstaking process was it wax and no. then you cut them and then it was actually glue sticks oh enough. is that what it was so and then you it was glue sticks wrapped in sheets of thermoplastic so and then just individually painted with and, uh the with the lips and the uh, uh for the lips i think i just finger painted i got my lipstick i got my fingers wet and then you just <laughs> on the yeah. end of each cigarette uh yeah and the reason they were made out of thermoplastic and glue sticks and we just didn't use fake ones because we had to do however many shows and we didn't want to be replenishing and sweeping us up every night so we just scattered a bunch of plastic cigarette butts all over the stage hundreds <laughs> yeah hundreds and it certainly yeah. it was it was very for a small theater company and for a large theater company i think those kind of details are really mm -hmm. so special uh for a director and for an audience to be able to to see how far uh and how specific that the the detail i mean it's all about the detail the devil is yeah. in the details so mark tell us about uh so you're at university of maryland uh, as a graduate student you're in projections and media and you become involved in a project at, for the geffen playhouse called someone else's house yeah right um tell us tell us about the the concept for the show what the what the show yeah what the show is so someone else's house uh it started off with um mostly just trying to think of which where where do I begin from this uh when I started off at the University of Maryland we were COVID had just hit I had actually already applied to the program and was waiting on my answer when COVID started to develop um so during that time period people and particularly media artists had to move into um what we what I've been calling pandemic theater which is um this unique situation where the media artists and the projections artists are actually primarily in control of what the production is because everything is filtered out through a stream or through the zoom feed or uh, things like that uh my mentor here jared mizachi did a very popular piece called russian troll farm and he wanted to do another media piece uh this time uh in a zoom feed it started off um with this idea of a ghost story that existed in his family uh he pitched the idea to geffen playhouse which is a um theater all the way out in la which was doing something called the stay house series which is uh their their own pandemic theater where they were where they've been um where they've been just having these zoom shows i really should stop calling it pandemic theater because virtual theater in itself has evolved mm -hmm. past that and i think it's here to stay but um uh what's it it became was uh he wrote a script uh based off of um that f the family story of a haunt a ha haunted house that they lived in um it went through revisions it went through retellings and it became this ghost story that we sit down in a zoom feed uh and jared tells you the story ghost story of his family and as the story unfolds we start to experience some of the haunting ourselves in the house um and it happens over zoom so it's not just something like a video where we see oh um these people are like a video in the sense that it can't be strongly distinguished from a short film uh jared talks to the audience he recognizes what people are doing uh as the show goes on he might make a reference that is just ad lib about 
what their expression is or what they're uh, how they're reacting to something. So he can uh, see the audience. Jared yep. can see the audience as well. So, okay. Not entirely through the show, but specific mm -hmm. parts of the show, we have the Zoom feed set up for him to talk to the audience. Um, but yeah, it grew into that. And the idea being that uh, we would do, he, we would be sitting around the, the Zoom campfire telling this ghost story. And then the ghost would jump out of the woods at us. <laughs> so very kind of, it was very heavily influenced um, by the Blair Witch Project and uh, the kind of feeling, especially the end of that, like this idea of talking about um, this haunting that occurred and informing everyone of the details, um, interviewing people. We uh, have recordings of his family and he's showing the evidence throughout the story and then it all explodes. And what was your role? My role in that show was uh, the video designer. So essentially what I did was I helped determine camera positions, the equipment necessary in order to accomplish those camera positions, the moves, uh, the framing of that, uh, as well as handling some of the inserted video and uh, yeah, just making sure that equipment and those um, solutions were available and necessary. Um, he actually, we make it look like he's carrying around either like a laptop or a cell phone, but what actually Jared is carrying around uh, is an entire camera rig um, with a wireless mm -hmm. webcam, a off-camera battery, his cell phone actually with the Zoom feed so he can monitor what's happening on the Zoom feed, um, and a microphone pack. So he's actually carrying around this rig. It looks like he's carrying around his laptop, but we needed all those pieces. We need power for a wireless webcam. Uh, we needed extra power for his phone. We needed extra power for uh, the wireless microphone. So. so is he actually controlling it or is he carrying it because we need to be where he is? We need to be where he is because he okay. moves through the house. So you're controlling it or someone else is controlling what we see. I mean, he's controlling it in that we were seeing it through him yeah. because he's carrying the camera, but you're technically driving yeah what? Uh, what he's controlling is the camera feed which is so he's essentially the cinematographer for us mm -hmm. um in that house um what's also being controlled is there's actually a stage manager out in la uh so this is the probably one of the greatest distances between a stage manager and the actual <laughs> show production because the show was performed in maryland uh, meanwhile, the stage manager is out there in LA. Um, and yeah, he, the stage manager cued the show, which uh, set up recordings and other technology and other uh, digital insertions into the show, as well as certain glitches, uh, video glitches that helped reaffirm the haunting. And then uh, Jared did all the cinematography uh, in the house. And there was a crew person in the sh inside the house that helped trigger certain physical effects like doors creaking open, uh, rooms changing, um, and lights changing uh, as the haunting occurred. So, and I actually did the run crew for this show a few times um, where it's uh, essentially what I'm doing is I'm running around the house dodging the camera because mm -hmm. I can't be seen on camera because that gives away the illusion, uh, mm -hmm. breaks the fourth wall. Uh, so to speak. And I'm like removing camera equipment, I'm removing tripod setups, I'm remove, I'm changing out projectors and stuff like that. I'm rearranging things, uh, hiding equipment so that Jared can move around the house and then show different parts of the house uh, without, uh, you know, re uh, revealing the tricks, so to speak. Is the, is the show, um, are, Jared's telling the story and then yep. you all are illustrating what happened in the story or is it illustrating what happened right now? I mean, is it's, it happening? Through video and the uh, insertions, we are uh, doing a few different things. We're like providing, I guess we're providing the evidence mm -hmm. um, as one would provide. So uh, I did, I handled a lot of the recordings for for phone conversations that Jared had with his mom because there's a, like this archive throughout the uh, show of Jared pooling information from his mom. Uh, and, you know, and we have the, the, the picture of her in the captioning and these, um, these videos are inserted throughout the show and he, and he uh, basically opens them by saying like, I asked my mom about this and here's what she had to say piece of evidence. Um, 
then we'll like go on Google Maps and click through and show the graveyard that's across the street. Uh, and we'll, uh, or we'll get these pictures of the old house or these old deeds or these old records of the house that go all the way back to the 19th century, uh, as well as the old family photos. And we'll insert those into the feed. Um, essentially, it doesn't sound like projections, but projections half the time is just taking these very same assets and put running them through a projector. Now we're running them through your Zoom feed and we're mm -hmm. running them through uh, a live stream, which is why media and projections people were uh, in a fortunate position for the pandemic and oftentimes had to take charge in these uh, scenarios uh, for uh, virtual and pandemic theater because we already had the skills developed, we already had the tools set out, set with us that it took to make these kinds of product productions. Was this a, a more complicated production than Russian Troll Farm? Did did it yeah. did it evolve in that way? And is that one of the reasons why? I can't speak to the complications of Russian Troll Farm too much because I wasn't on that mm -hmm. production specifically. Um, it was a different one um, because this one had the audience's presence in the room. There was this sense of, and the reason we did that is because we wanted to inspire. Uh, this sense of aliveness um, when we're in these virtual spaces and we're watching virtual theater sometimes it can feel a little bit like a movie and it and it, we have to ask ourselves what distinguishes virtual theater from television and film um, i think one of the best ways to answer that is by interacting with the audience and i think there's other answers too um, that haven't been fully explored um, one idea that was thrown around for this show actually was taking the Zoom feed and projecting it in the space. That was a very early mm -hmm. draft of the show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is a way that, because in doing, doing something like that, we see, the audience sees themselves in the presence of the show. See, when we're in the theater, we can look around, we see other people, we see the people on stage. There's a mutual awareness of mm -hmm. each other when we're doing certain kinds of uh, virtual theater, that mutual awareness may not be as present as we'd like it to be. Um, and that's why this format was chosen with the Zoom feed and talking to people in the Zoom because it optimizes that liveness. The Someone Else's House was very, very favorably um, reviewed in the New York Times. Do you, what do you feel is the, were, is in large part due to the popularity. What do you think drove that? There's the there's sort of the review of it, but yeah. then there's the audience review of it, which you said was was quite successful and sold out. I think there's um, a we've been we've been interacting with each other a lot through Zoom through social media lately, especially during uh, the pandemic, um, and because of that, um, we're kind of we're acclimated to these kinds of environments and perhaps we're craving for something exciting to happen in these environments, you know? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and that it, it, in that way, um, uh, someone, house, someone else's house fulfills that need. Um, I think also relating to the idea of just death in general, um, because that's been a topic that's been all around us throughout the pandemic, um, the risk, the deadliness of it. Um, and a lot of what's talked about in someone else's house is a ghost story of these people, the past and these people are haunting us. And so, and while that is a little bit indirect, it's still just at our heart right now where we're like, we're stuck in a house and mm -hmm. the idea of death is all around us. So, yeah, I think those are two things that really led to its reception and that that desperate want for liveness in the theater space and to do something, bring liveness to the Zoom space. Do you think that the virtual space um, does offer sort of a, a, an intimacy, if you will, that is harder that is, I guess, more personal um, than one that you might experience in in the theater? More personal. 
That that's difficult. I think sometimes it, yes, because especially in those larger houses, like one thing I think many of us love about black box theater is that it's so personal and intimate. Um, we can really connect with the audience and the audience can connect with us. Um, I think Zoom does that better than any giant house, mm -hmm. any 1500 seat house or a thousand seat house. Uh, I feel like if you can connect to the people on a Zoom feed or in a virtual space, uh, you're going to do that more, that's going to be more successful for that connection than in a massive Broadway house. Um, regarding the comparison to the black box theater, I think they're equal in some regards. Um, in the Zoom space, we there's something we're lacking, which is we cannot look to the left and look to the right and see the other bystanders among us. Um, the audience, think like of, as an audience yeah. member, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the things that was so shocking about this show and the ending and what had many people really scared at the end of this show was because they were just sitting there watching a show on their laptop and everything was going down and everything was going wrong and there was real danger in front of them and all they had to, the only other person who was next to them was like their husband or wife or their uh, a few family members because uh, some people like to watch it as a group they got like to sit on their couch and uh, sit in front of their laptop and that bystander effect is lost in the zoom world because now it's just a small group and you're watching this man get scared scared the crap get the crap scared out of him because uh he's experiencing this horrible haunting and you're just watching the train wreck in front of you on your laptop so and did that do you think that that just engendered a sense of helplessness for people that they you know they they wanted to do something but they didn't know what is was the chat used as a function in that was there any way they could communicate with you so yeah, some people did use the chat. Uh, at the end of the show, some people refused to, refused to get off the Zoom feed or had to be told to get off the Zoom feed because they thought Jared was in actual danger. They thought he was actually hurt or actually injured. And they're like, is someone going to check on him? Is he okay? Like what mm -hmm. happened? Um, and because they had they were helpless, <laughs> they were just how, how watching did you the train handle wreck. that? How did you handle that? Did Did someone come on or? Yeah, we there was a house management um, through Geffen Playhouse, and they did an excellent job. Um, they, the show actually ends, they sort of uh, fit, end the show, so to speak, because uh, the show essentially cuts out at the end. Right, right. Um, yeah. And what happens is uh, they're like, I guess Jared's not with us anymore. So, and then they give like the ending speech of like, thanks for coming to Geffen Playhouse. See you all later. <laughs> and everyone's like on the Zoom feed still like, is he okay? Did someone, should someone call the police? Like, is someone checking on him? And uh, yeah, <laughs> it was interesting. Funny enough, one night his mom came to see the show. Uh, Jared's mom came to see the show, and at the end of the show, she was like, eh, "I'm sure, she, I'm, I'm sure he's fine." So. <laughs> they know how this story, the yeah. story goes. And you were, they were. He, Jared was in the house that he grew up in. That this story, that these, that this unfolded, in, or was this a different house? Uh, I don't reveal. Okay, all right. We're secrets. not. We don't want to get into too specifics of it. Okay. And yes. is there? It, can I ask? Was the show? Did was the show different every night it was it was a little bit different every night because he did interact with different people and it definitely grew as time passed um i remember how it looked on opening night and then i came back because they needed someone to fill in the crew and i was like wow this show is taking a lot of different beats a lot of different turns you know uh and also like i think the most different night was when he had to perform it for his mom because mm -hmm. now it was so the person, one of the people who were central to the storyline was just like, you can't do that the same way that you do every other show and like having his mom in the audience. So, yeah. What for you as an, as an artist and as a working in media and projections now are the, are, are the things that excite you about a world where virtual theater will exist 
um, what do you feel it can do really well? Is it does it have to do with that size of the house that you just talked about, where you can create yeah. this intimacy that normally we might only see in a small theater? Um, is it is it that? Is there some aspect of the fact that y'all are really driving the bus? I know with this show, Eric and Bob are are all like they're making the show happen really you know yeah. unlike on a traditional theater where the actors have I, to fix it you know if whatever happens yeah uh and uh, honestly in live theater we got to fix things that just happen too you know right. i, I mean, mean that's in, not entirely in live fair. virtual theater right. yeah <laughs> like uh the, the mistakes do happen i think uh on the production of russian troll farm there was one night where the stream crashed and everyone mm -hmm. had to get back into the stream yeah um I think the primary the primary benefit of virtual theater is bringing the sense of live theater directly into the intimate space of your home. Mm -hmm. uh, that increases accessibility. That reaches audiences that will that you'll never reach. Um, we had people. So the the um, Stay House series is um, produced by Geth and Playhouse, um, which is out in LA. Um, we had people all across the country logging in to see the show. We had people from Canada, from Europe, from Singapore. I think we think we had one guy from uh, Japan because we saw Japanese signage behind. Him. <laughs> so it's just like, these are audiences we would never reach before. Also accessibility for people who can't always get out of their house, the mm -hmm. elderly, uh, this, um, certain people, people with certain disabilities. Um, those people may not be able to experience live theater um, or to experience it is a significant challenge. And virtual theater allows us to bring that directly to their home in the same way that television revolutionized um, the way we stare at a screen and lit, and watch a story unfold in front of us because now we were getting it right in our homes. Why would we go to the theaters in the, in the 19, uh, into the, in the 20th century uh, when we could have a television in our home? You know, it was, it was supposed to kill the movie theater. It didn't. I don't think virtual theater is going to, was ever meant to kill theater, but uh, now we have another way to work, uh, express ourselves and uh, engage in our art. Mm -hmm. Well, that's certainly true of this show. You know, we are, yeah. uh, you know, obviously we've reached more people in the last, since this has been happening in June a year ago, than yeah. we could be doing theater for the rest of our lives and and at a 60 seat, a 60 seat house or whatever, uh, around that number of seats, we it would take a long time. Now it's a very different thing we're doing, but the idea is that people get to know that there is a company in Philadelphia that's working in existentialism and there's a company that's working in absurdism and that, you know, um, and so it, it's a freedom, if you will, Mark, like you say, and it also allows us to connect with people that for whatever reason, um, choice or that they wouldn't get out to the theater or be able to meet us otherwise. Um, yeah. Distance you, is oftentimes the biggest barrier. <laughs> so. yeah. How do you think theaters will, or how, how do you envision that the virtual space will will move forward. Would would, it, would you imagine that it would be projects like the ones you've been working on, where it's a story around the campfire, you know, to yeah. pull to pull your that beautiful image, and that we work with the projections and, and media the way you're talking about in someone else's house? Do you think that, or and or do you think it will be filmed productions? that will, everyone will be taping their shows and running them that way or a combination of both? I think it's, I think it will be a little bit of everything. I think now that um, the floodgates are open to the possibilities, um, theaters are going to engage in these kinds of, this kind of media, how we see fit. Um, it's what's most interest. what I, I think is most interesting about this is what we've done, what we've been forced to do as theater artists is expand into the, expand into the web, expand into the, uh, the uh, virtual meeting space, the internet spaces, the um, Skype spaces, uh, and the live streaming spaces. So I think we're going to see plenty of companies still doing live streams. I am hoping that we see more of these kind of video conferencing space style uh, shows where someone's in the Zoom feed with you and they're putting on a performance with you because that has a certain sense of intimacy and liveness that can't be matched. I hope that we also 
take our live in-person performances, although even this is in-person because we are, we are people, we are here and we're in here. <laughs> but, um, I hope we take our in-theater performances. I hope we find better ways to make them accessible through the use of cam cameras, uh, filming, and perhaps even involve uh, these virtual spaces in, the, in this um, in-person, in-theater space more so. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, I've been playing with a few ideas in my head about how we can make some sort of hybrid production um, where the Zoom space is just as involved in what's happening on stage as the people who are actually sitting in the theater space. And that's two different ways to experience the production. And they're mm -hmm. both equally legitimate. Um, yeah, I think it, it's here to stay. I think so. Mm -hmm. And I hope that um, writers and producers uh, remain open to the idea. I think immediately now that we're all reopening and the uh, season starting again, I think immediately everyone's just going to want to pick up where they left off, literally pick up the show that was canceled due to COVID <laughs> and put it up. Uh, we're seeing plenty of that. That's okay. I think we're going to get, uh, we're going to return back to the virtual theater after we've been through like a fall and a spring of, mm -hmm. you know, it's so just funny doing our regular theater. <laughs> so, sorry to interrupt you. Mark. No, go ahead. I, I, no, I was just going to say I, 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 I could see that I could see that happening. Is that there's there's something that that has been gained that's very rich and very intimate and very um, personal about this space. And as you were talking, um, I was thinking, oh gosh, you could you know you could do a situation where you're at the theater and you have Into the Absurd happening, right? And Mark, mm -hmm. you come in to see the show, but we're doing a before show. I mean, not dissimilar to a red carpet chat or whatever, but you're sort of getting a sense, even if you're not going to be able to see the show, you're getting a sense of what that show is. And maybe you're talking to the actors and maybe you're talking to the directors they are coming in, or maybe you're getting, you're giving people a backstage tour yeah, you know, as as the shows, that's a very fundamental way of, of of using it, and not in the same way that you were speaking of. But for a small theater, it really does expand that concept of the post show discussion that we that we all, you know, it brings us closer to our audience, and we get to talk about the things that happen in the show. But the practicalities of it sometimes just aren't there if you're a small company and you've got a cast of ten or twenty or more, and they need to get home, or you, you know, it sometimes it just doesn't really work itself out. But if you integrate it in a different way, because I know we're talking about using this show as a way of, of when we are back live, of, of doing the backstage tour, of really talking to people. And it makes it possible that you don't have to be in, you don't have, I don't have to be in a broadcast channel to do that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so it really levels things out and then you get very fancy with it, the way you're talking about, and you can bring all kinds of, I mean, we're talking about we were in you and I were in a meeting the other night about a an adaptation um, that David Robson, a playwright in uh, Wilmington, Philadelphia area, has written of um, Strindberg's uh, *The Stronger*, and his wife Sonia Robson. Um, you know, and I are look uh, we're looking we're yes we're we're picking your brain and and using all of your your yeah. skill and understanding as a way to add that as a as an event to our schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, as you said, we've learned so many new tricks from the virtual space um, and so many things that we can use to leverage ourselves as artists and theater companies uh, that advantages us even greater than, than we were before. So I, we're coming out of this pandemic a lot stronger, I think, mm -hmm. uh, because of what we learned. Um, and to go on with that idea of adaptation, you know, you think about what what were the first films oftentimes there were adaptations of you know written novels and stuff like that and even to this day we often write novels or uh before adapting them to film or tv i think as we move forward and as virtual theater becomes more popular and more prevalent we're going to see work that is specifically made and adapted for these spaces um that are so that they can be staged in staged uh in these virtual spaces that's what someone else house someone else's house was uh we a few uh, of um my colleagues and acquaintances uh with jared we talked about because he's been he did i think 67 performances of this show he performed it that like over 60 times and wow. 
yeah, there was a discussion at one point where it's like, are we going to play find someone to play Jared Mizachi because he's playing mm -hmm. himself? Like, are mm -hmm. we going to find a professional actor to play Jared Mizachi because the show is in demand? It's extended. Uh, there might be there's talks of putting it up again one more time, um, or uh, and a series just preliminary talks. Mm -hmm. But um, once you replace Jared Mizachi with a professional actor and you have this script, now this is something that we sell to someone else another company and they reproduce this show as you do with mm -hmm. any as you do with tennessee williams like mm -hmm. reproducing this show and reproducing this script that's something that we kind of realized at one point is like but we had never considered um and that's how new work is born that's mm -hmm. how these new spaces are born like these scripts have to this i hope one day that this someone else's house gets reproduced somewhere that would be amazing <laughs> so and Does, it would be revolutionary. Do you think the show, I mean, it obviously would be different if someone if someone came in and, and, and replaced it, but in your observation, how much of the of the, you know, just the very fabric of this storytelling and this show and Jared's life and his family is is. I mean, I guess you could say that of any integral. show that is, yeah, is integral. I mean, you could say that of anybody who, who originates yeah. a role and we just identify, you know, them with that role forever, but someone else takes it on and they, they put their spin on it. But it sounds like this is in his bones, literally. I think a lot, there's plenty of solo pieces like that, where it is all about the original, the person who originally wrote it or uh, the character it's about or whatever autobiography it is. And you know, that's one of the uh, terrible things we sometimes do as theater artists. We take someone else's story, we, we relate to it, and then we run with it in a completely <laughs> different direction. You know, yeah, right, sometimes right. Uh, sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's it tramples on the story. Yeah. Oh yeah. wow, we tried. Yeah. <laughs> or we yeah. Did. It's an evolution, right? Yeah, it's always um, an evolution. There's a question here, Mark. Um, can you speak to the ever greater use of projections in live theater before the before the pandemic and now also going forward? And what that can answer to, uh, what, what that can add to uh, a piece. And yeah, and I have a follow-up question to that. Yeah, um, projections can do a lot of different things. Uh, a, projections are just getting used more because the technology is cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Like you can you can buy a pretty decent projector um, for like a hundred bucks these days, mm -hmm. you know? it's. It's just everywhere. It's within the hands of avant-garde theater and every kind of artist. And the technology has gotten easier to use. We have QLab to thank for that. Although, uh, you know, you have to be using a Mac and it's still expensive and that locks out a lot of uh, younger younger people mm -hmm. from, the, uh, from that. Uh, I'm currently studying mostly with Isadora. Uh, there's tons of other software out there now. Um, why can't I think of it? Disguise, which I think is called something else now um not something else now it's, they named it something other than disguise mm -hmm. <laughs> so people are going to google search something else now <laughs> uh yeah it's so that's one of the reasons accessibility has increased for projection design software just uh projections projections in general more software mm -hmm. cheaper equipment uh, you can put the stuff everywhere and higher lumen outputs are possible. You don't have to, th there was a day and age when you had to stack like four projectors together in order to get a bright image. Uh, mm -hmm. We still do that occasionally. In fact, I did that uh, for a disco project I did uh, in the spring. We stacked two high power projectors because we had to compete with street lights. Um, but now you can just buy a projector, you can throw it in your black box and it's, it's ready to go. It's ready to project. Um, I think people are, I think uh, playwrights are starting to think about um, how that can be used more often. I think we're getting more contemporary stories. Uh, projections look really weird if you're in Victorian England and Sherlock mm -hmm. Holmes is running around. You just like, yes, you can, but it's whenever someone sees a projection on stage, they're usually keenly aware that they're looking at a projection. It's mm -hmm. you can hide it. There's it can be used for effects. Mm -hmm. um with uh quite well um but it's a it's a tough question because there's just so many different ways that projections can be used you can wash the stage you can put something up on a specific wall uh you can show someone dreaming you can be inside mm -hmm. the head mm -hmm. of the person on stage and just 
that's what I did for a project I did at Rowan, where this young woman, uh, this young woman would uh, tell the audience of her nightmares, uh, these premonitions she'd have about disasters and how they would just attack her mind. Um, and we'd be in her head thinking about all these normal things or like thinking about these superhero cartoons that she'd watch as a young girl and then just these horrible images of tragedy would strike during the show during these dreams uh and they were in a very mm -hmm. jarring way and that's the point because it's incredibly jarring for her um yeah as shadow speak, puppetry too <laughs> so i'm just thinking as you're speaking about it mark that the, it feels to me like the work of eugenia nesco which is very surreal and has this um incredible lightness of being to it sometimes there's um a play where in one of his plays where very difficult for a small theater company to solve this design challenge where you need this large it's about a regret and um and it's called Amide or um how to get rid of it and it's and you know you have this husband and wife and they haven't left their apartment in years and there's a side story that's very integral which is a, about a um a, a child that is deceased but it's about regret and how regret grows and there's a body that continues to just sort of grow and grow and it pushes through walls and then it floats down the Seine and it's you know and I love this play and I love what it represents but it you know it it has provided some food for thought along the years and trying to figure out how to and not that projections haven't been around because they have but yeah. but what you're saying about it being more accessible now I think that it really this world of imagination and the world particularly that Eugenia Inesco inhabits a lot where you have just people in these very surreal um that's a you know that's a those are themes and tones that he that he just is in all the yeah, time that's that's, uh, I told you I was reading The Killer. That's one of the reasons mm -hmm. I was looking at that play because there's just, uh, and that's a signature of his, that magical moment um, mm -hmm. uh, that's always in the play or at the end of the play. Um, yeah, that's funny that everything you were just describing is like, are we talking about COVID again? Because <laughs> that's <laughs> that's what it felt like. Well, you know, for all those years when, 16 years ago, when we started mm -hmm. the IRC and, you know, fairly enough people would say is, is, is existential is is absurd a place we really want to live is that what we really go to the theater for and you know I've always felt that the big questions are the ones that are interesting and they certainly were to us which is why the company was formed and i think yeah. with the pandemic um it it put a whole new sort of focus for me and in thinking about the shows that we'll be looking at as we you know mm -hmm. we re-enter re um I, I, I'm, I'm ex super excited to hear all that you're talking about in terms of projections, because I think for a small company that has a limited budget, doing something like what we did with Charles Mee's Paradise Park, when um, Anna Corrali did the projections for that, um, for that show, that was, that was a, a, a really large, it, it, that show looked so different than anything else we'd done. We had to be in what, 20 different places. Charles Mee just beautifully takes you to all, this all took place in one in mm -hmm. one amusement park, yeah. but we had to really, in designing that set, Anna had to really get her head around that. So in, in little studio five up there at the Walnut, we were with a projector and, and it was a big step, but it, but it really opened up a lot of doors in terms of like as an existentialist or absurdist theater company could, knowing that projections could, could be really used mm -hmm. to really further the story in an exciting way. What kinds of, um, what's on the docket for you at uh, next semester at school what what are the kinds of classes that you'll be taking and what will you be learning uh on on my next next semester docket is uh let's see public projections which is just um jared talking about it's it's us uh, it's basically us sitting down with jared and uh, just trying to solve certain problems in the idea of like you know projections that are viewed out in mm -hmm. the world and how uh a how projections can be used outside of the theater space but also uh in other places um i'm gonna be doing some drawing and rendering courses um what else um i'm helping lead uh not lead but you know i'm helping uh facilitate a large um equipment purchase that uh the Brin institute at university of maryland which is this new institute um for uh multi interdisciplinary um, performance that has been founded here at UMD. Uh, we're making this massive camera purchase so we can start utilizing cameras because cameras and image capture is how we accomplish a lot of things in projection mm -hmm. uh, and media design. 
when you when you think about what a projections or media artist does, it's we are theater artists who take take or create video and digital or digital assets and find ways to utilize them in performance. And that's not limited to the stage. That's not limited to virtual the virtual space. Uh, we find a way to get these assets into the space and how to enhance the performance, shape the performance, or create the performance. Um, the things that's why I was saying earlier, like the things that we as media artists knew about projections were just it's just a matter of which way I send the video, whether I send it over the Zoom feed or I send it out of a projector. Mm -hmm. It's all the same. <laughs> Not all the same, but yeah, it's very similar. But it does sound like I, yeah. I love your your former point about writing plays that incorporate really thinking specifically about how mm -hmm. could we make and it's happening and, and we are yeah. watching it but the, the many different ways in which that can be those those pieces can be integrated to create a new kind of experience that seems like it would be a very exciting um yeah. place and, for you to be thinking and adaptations too like as you were thinking about uh, as you were talking about um unesco's plays i was thinking about like could that be something that we set up a camera a house with cameras in it and the you know the it's it's in the walls it's happening in this space and we're trapped in the space how do we make that different from a television show yeah there's ways there's interactions yeah. that can happen how do how does the audience feel like they're really really there um in that we space should talk them? about that play mark that's one that's been on the <laughs> yeah. list for a long time and for so, for so long you know we were thinking about studio five and its dimensions of what i'm guesstimating here but 40 by 22 or something and mm -hmm. how do we you know how does that body that pup because i think i might have talked to you about this at one point where this sort of puppet grows larger and larger and as the little man and the little woman who have not left their apartment in forever they get all of their groceries up through a you know they get them through the window um partly because of this regret that they have the as as their fear grows the regret grows and it pushes through the walls and then it starts to like crowd the little man and the little woman out you know and then it yeah. and then it blows out the window and goes down the sand and as do, as does happen a lot in unesco's plays it takes on many you know many different um shapes and colors but but it's an important part of the play and it needs to happen that regret floats away and then they try to actually retrieve it you know um and then there's yeah. a war of course um but yeah i'd love to i'd love to talk yeah, to I'll you have more to, about that i'll have to get my hands on that script <laughs> so. oh it's a good one yeah, yeah yeah mark i can't believe it it's 5 57. yeah how did we do that i've so enjoyed talking with there's you there's so many interesting things to talk about in media and projections oh my gosh yes. uh, these days so it's been I, a developing fast well, I'm so excited to see, to stay in touch with you. Of course, we're going to be working on this project that just is in its, its first, um, its first phases, but I'm really excited to see where you are headed and where do you think you're headed? Do you know? I'm, I'm hoping that I can go back to Philadelphia and, uh, you know, get my feet back in there as a projections and media artist, uh, and our, and, you know, my I won't say, say it's my home city because you know I'm from New Jersey, but you know it is it is the city that my career started in. So uh, my home city, Philadelphia. So yeah, I want to get my feet back in there. So well, I cannot wait to see what's in store for you, and yeah. and and I'll be seeing you soon. We'll be working on this project, and mm -hmm. we're so delighted to have you. So Mark, uh, thank you so much for taking time to be to with us and like expand all of our minds about. The projects you're working on and what's coming down the line and i think that one thing we can be sure of is that we're going to go back to, we're going to re-enter a very changed landscape yep. literally and what things look like on the stage and what we're what we're going to have uh, access to and the kinds of experiences that we're going to have and it makes me feel very excited that you're involved in in that yeah um, in, in designing those experiences for us because you've always done beautiful work and thank you for letting me spread the word about uh, virtual theater a bit too. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I'm delighted to, I think we all are excited to be in live spaces again, but also I, th I think both people that are working in the theater world and just audiences in general are realizing that there were benefits to be had and yep. the ways in which they can get integrated in that experience are, are pretty, I think are pretty exciting. And most importantly, they're not mutually exclusive, exclusive from each other all the time. So <laughs> right. they can blend together beautifully. So, 
Well, get out there and do it, Mark. And, and absolutely. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you so, so very, very much for being here. Thank you, Tina. And thanks to all of you for joining us here on Into the Absurd. We have a little bit of a programming note to share with you after, gosh, how many years? No, it's, it's been a little over a year, but since March of 2020 was when we started just testing Bob Schmidt and Erica Holster and I and a number of wonderful theater artists here in Philadelphia and around the country got together and decided that we wanted to stay in touch with each other every week. And we were wanting to be creative and share creativity and stay connected. And with you as the audience, we wanted your questions and your input and just all of your great energy as we all one step at a time just worked our way through a very dark forest. And it's been a wonderful year. And this is a show that's gonna stay uh, here at the IRC into the absurd. But what we're gonna be doing for the next month or so is taking a little hiatus. We'll be back during the Fringe Festival. We have some exciting guests lined up from here in Philadelphia Theater that are gonna be joining us during the four weeks of the Fringe. I don't have those dates right in front of me, but I believe the Fringe starts on September the 7th and it runs through that first week in October. So during this little hiatus, we have not missed a week yet, but we're gonna take some time for a little thinking and vacation and also to get our heads around what, um, where we're going to be when we come back out into live theater and what our season is going to look like. We We've told you a couple of times that we're looking at Tennessee Williams, the two character play. We are also looking at Enda Walsh's The New Electric Ballroom, and we're looking at a number of different small venues around the city. And so we thought we should be putting our head towards what that can look like and get prepared for that, hopefully uh, in the early part of, of uh, 2022. So we'll take a couple of weeks off here and we will see you back during the fringe. And then the way that we'd love to use Into the Absurd in the future is perhaps not a weekly show, but a time for us to gather around the campfire, as Mark said, and to share what is happening with shows when we get back on stage, maybe to integrate some of these ideas in an opening night um, sort of in theater virtual Zoom party that we could have. We will be thinking with the help of Mark and other artists the ways that we can integrate you into the work because it's been such a rewarding experience uh, for us. But we're gonna just take that little bit of time to plan it out and to think about it. And if you're on the IRC's mailing list, which I'm sure most of you are, you'll get that email from us. They won't be weekly, but they will be when we have something new to announce. And you can expect to see us, oh, say monthly or when a show is happening and when we feel the time is right for us to join together. We talked a little bit about with Mark, uh, a show that playwright David Robson is working on, his wife, Sonia, who you know from um, two iterations of The Bald Soprano, where we were all on stage together. She and I are going to be working on a project, an adaptation of um, Strindberg's The Stronger, and we're hoping to bring that to you around the holidays. So we have some exciting uh, plans in the works, and we just need a little bit of time in the room to think through all of that, and we think our time will be well spent, and it will give you all the vacation from us for just a little while. But from Bob Schmidt and Erica Holscher and everyone here at the IRC, for, I'm getting a little verklempt talking about it, but um, it's been a, a, a wonderful time to share with you, to get us through the pandemic, and we can't wait to see what Into the Absurd is going to look like in the future, and we hope that you'll be there in the audience with us uh, when we come back. We'll see you during the Fringe. Look for emails from us or on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. We'll be letting you know what's happening and we can't wait to be in conversation with you again. And just so many thanks for giving us the strength to make it through this very unusual time. And we're gonna take that and we're gonna put it to good use as we head out into the world on the live stages. And um, I can't wait to see you there. Take care.